Welcome to Deep Pockets by Petra Söderling, a conversation about governments, technologies, and innovation. The ongoing season, winter 2023, is loosely based on my upcoming book, Governments and Innovation, The Economic Developer's Guide to Our Future. The book will be available for purchase in Amazon during Q1 2023. Our theme song is by New Orleans jazz icon Leroy Jones. On November 15, 2021, President Joe Biden signed into a law a $1.2 trillion bill, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This budget was a long time coming. A McKinsey report from 2020 says that globally we spend more than $2.5 trillion US dollars a year on infrastructure, but that $3.7 trillion would be needed every year between 2020 and 2035 just to keep up with the GDP growth we have estimated that we need. This is important because the GDP growth estimates are being used to allocate many other resources that affect people's lives. In other words, the world is missing $1.2 trillion every year from its infrastructure investments just to be able to keep the ball rolling. We would need Biden's once-in-a-lifetime five-year plan every year, and still we would not have made any progress. That's how much infrastructure debt there is globally. The bipartisan law has over 2,700 pages. It passed by 228 to 206 vote and is said to finally modernize America's aging infrastructure to be on par with the rest of the world. President Biden said in the signing ceremony that generations from now, people will look back and know this is when America won the economic competition for the 21st century. When a politician says it, you may want to take it with a pinch of salt. But he was not alone. The Brookings Institution, an independent and non-governmental think tank, called this law generation-defining and more meaningful than the New Deal from 1933. CNBC said this bill spurs hopes of small business boom. Workers' unions welcomed it. Large corporations welcomed it. In June 2022, another bill passed that will bring even more power to Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This is the Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation Reduction Act, among many other good things, includes subsidies for clean energy. To discuss the Infrastructure Investment Bill and how it changes energy demand and supply, I'm joined by Rao Konidena, energy market expert in distributed energy resources and author of Modern Electricity Energy Systems. Welcome back to Deep Pockets, Rao. Oh, thank you, Petra. It's good to be back. It's been a while. So how does the infrastructure investment bill affect American energy landscape? Well, there are many ways uh, this uh, infrastructure bill uh, will affect the American energy landscape, uh, I think because of the Biden administration's goals of 100% carbon-free electricity by 2035 and a um, net zero carbon economy by 2050. So this uh, one trillion or trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, signed by President Joe Biden on November 15th, 2021 includes, um, I think about uh, 550 billion in new spending um, and with a full uh, 65 billion uh, earmarked for upgrading our uh, national power infrastructure in the U.S. That's a remarkable amount of public spending indeed, but how will the law in practice change America? Well, there are many ways in, uh, in which this uh, law will change, but let's take one step at a time. So first, uh, starting with the transportation sector, vehicles, uh, because that has an impact on the energy landscape. Uh, the president's goal is uh, building a national network of uh, 500,000, half a million electric vehicle chargers to make sure electric vehicles are accessible to all Americans for both uh, local and long distance trips. The law uh, includes $5 billion in formula uh, funding for states uh, with a goal to build a national charging network. And then 10% is set aside each year uh, for the Secretary of Transportation 
to provide grants to states to help fill in the gaps in these uh, networks. Um, the law also provides, I think, like 2.5 billion for communities and corridors through a competitive grant program. Uh, and, and that will support innovative approaches and ensure that uh, the charger deployment meets the administration priorities, such as supporting rural charging, improving local air quality, and as well as increasing the EV um, electric vehicle charging access in uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, I, I want to put a final point on electric vehicles before moving on, uh, which is the administration strategy is actually working with the industry, uh, recognizing the current uh, supply chain bottlenecks. Uh, so for example, um, since uh, lithium uh, is a critical input to batteries, um, where the United States currently has a, a very limited or uh, little domestic supply, the Biden administration has funded two dozen teams to actually expand the um, sourcing of lithium from geothermal brines and approved a permit for the Nevada-based uh, Thacker Pass uh, lithium mine. Um, so automakers um, in general are signing contracts uh, that leverage domestic supply, including Ford, uh, which is sourcing lithium from I think, recycled content through a company called Redwood Materials, which is by an ex-Tesla uh, chief uh, technology officer, I think. And then GM is also sourcing lithium from geothermal brines in the Salton Sea with Controlled Thermal Resources Company, as well as Tesla is sourcing lithium from a, a Piedmont project in North Carolina. Uh, fascinating. That being said, isn't it correct that there have been some encouraging steps uh, in the field lately in general? Absolutely. Um, and, and Petra, if you recall, uh, General Motors announced a, a third Altium uh, cells manufacturing plant in Lansing, Michigan, uh, early this year. Uh, Altium cells is a joint venture of LG Energy Solution and General Motors. I'm actually excited about this excite, uh, in this announcement because um, according to the uh, press release, Altium batteries are unique in the industry uh, because the large format pouch style cells can be stacked vertically or horizontally inside a, the battery pack. Uh, this allows the engineers to optimize battery energy storage and layout for each vehicle design. And those energy options range from 50 to 200 kilowatt hours which could enable a, a GM, I think, estimated, estimates the range to up to 450 miles uh, or more on a full charge with a uh, zero to 60 miles per hour acceleration in three seconds. So GM's future Altium powered uh, EVs, electric vehicles are designed for level two and uh, DC fast charging. And most will be, uh, I think, 400 volt battery packs and up to 200 kW kilowatt fast charging capability, while GM's truck platform will have an 800 volt battery and a 350 kW fast charging capability. So to stay with the news then, uh, because it's tough to follow so many developments in this industry, they are all happening at the same time. Uh, I want to mention that the Department of Energy in US has announced a conditional loan of $2.5 billion dollars for Altium Cells, this joint venture that we are talking about between General Motors and LG Energy Solutions, to help finance the next generation uh, EV lithium-ion battery cells in three states. Uh, this loan is intended to support the expansion of EV deployment in the U.S. and is expected to close within months to help Altium produce EV batteries for GM, which plans to manufacture million EVs uh, a year by uh, 2025. If you recall, uh, President Obama had that goal when he originally came into the administration, but now we are finally reaching that tipping point here uh, with these uh, infrastructure uh, loans and such. So just to wrap this up, the U.S. government's uh, Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Loan Program, which was uh, previously, which has previously lent money to Tesla, uh, Ford, and Nissan is providing the funding, and that program hasn't issued new loans since 2010. So it's uh, also the first time that a D, uh, this uh, DOE program has issued a loan exclusively for a battery cell uh, manufacturing project. And these uh, factories are located in US, in Michigan, 
Ohio and and Tennessee and the three facilities are expected to create I think like uh, 6,000 uh, well-paid construction jobs and more than 5,000 operation jobs once they reach um, full capacity according to the Department of Energy. Yeah, I've been following the announcements on these battery um, plants. It, it's really encouraging. Uh, it's been intriguing to follow on, on the news. Could you tell us something about clean energy and electricity transmission? What are the latest news there? Sure. So uh, infrastructure uh, is not just uh, transportation, right? It's uh, also electricity. And uh, when we talk about electricity, we talk about transmission uh, to move this electricity. So the Office of uh, Electricity at the Department of Energy has uh, released something called a Notice of Intent, NOI, on uh, building a better grid initiative uh, to upgrade and expand um, U.S. uh, electric transmission grid to support Uh, resiliency, reliability, and decarbonization. Under this uh, Building a Better Grid initiative, the Department of Energy will identify um, critical national transmission needs and support the build-out of long-distance high-voltage transmission facilities that meet those needs through collaborative transmission planning, um, innovative uh, financing schemes, and then coordinated permitting and uh, continued transmission-related research and development. I think the DOE commitment to robust engagement on energy justice and collaboration with this new administration includes collaborating with states, American Indian tribes, and uh, I believe Alaska natives also, uh, as well as industry, unions, local communities, and other stakeholders. Um, Some of the highlights, actually, for this initiative, Building a Better Grid, include offshore wind uh, goal of uh, 30 gigawatt uh, deployed by 2030. I think the law also provides more than $20 billion to establish something called an Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, and it supports clean energy technology demonstrations in areas including clean hydrogen, carbon capture, grid-scale energy storage, small modular reactors, and more. I'm really excited about small modular react because the demonstration projects can prove the effectiveness of these innovative technologies in real world conditions at scale in order to pave the way for more widespread adoption and deployment. The founding of this office, I believe, represents a new chapter that builds on DOE's longstanding position as an international driver uh, for clean energy research and development expanding DOE's scope to fill a critical innovation gap on the path to net zero emissions by uh, 2050. Uh, Additionally, uh, DOE has been busy, and so additionally they have released a RFI, uh, Request for Information, that seeks information on direct air capture, point source uh, carbon capture, geologic storage, carbon dioxide infrastructure, and uh, more emerging um, carbon management technology areas where demonstration and deployment has been limited. So uh, just to wrap this up, DOE also has new ways to uh, finance these projects uh, as well. So much there. Uh, It's wonderful to hear. We actually had Michael Hecht from New Orleans, GNO Inc., uh, as a guest here a couple of episodes back, and he was talking about the offshore oil and gas rigs off the coast of Louisiana and how they're putting offshore wind on those routes. So there's a lot of very innovative things happening all over America. So um, about the companies, do you think this is changing how the American energy companies invest in infrastructure? And if yes, how so? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, in general, the American companies are uh, changing uh, energy companies. And if you just take uh, statistics from the American Society of Civil Engineers, for example, they had uh, uh, released a report card for America's infrastructure in 2021. And they say in uh, this uh, digital and connected world, Americans are increasingly relying on readily available and uninterrupted electricity. So over the last four years, transmission distribution and reliability focused pipeline investments have increased to your earlier point. And uh, outages have declined uh, slightly. So annual spending on high voltage transmission lines grew from $18.6 billion in 2012 to almost $22 billion in uh, 2017. 
but uh, annual spending on distribution systems, uh, which is called the last mile of the electricity network, that grew at 54% over the last two decades. Um, utilities are taking proactive steps to strengthen the electric grid through resilience measures. However, um, I think the weather remains an increasing threat. Uh, among the 638 transmission outage events reported during the four-year period of two, uh, 2014 to 2018, severe weather was cited as a predominant cause. Additionally, distribution infrastructure struggles with the reliability, with 92% of all outages occurring uh, along those distribution segments. So in the coming years, additional transmission distribution infrastructure smart planning, improved reliability are needed to accommodate the changing energy landscape as uh, energy delivery becomes more distributed and renewables grow, uh, according to this uh, uh, 2021 report card by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, just a few weeks ago, terawatt ener- infrastructure, uh, an EV uh, electric vehicle charging startup for commercial fleet, announced they raised more than a billion dollars because the law uh, will increase high voltage transmission investments due to renewables interconnection challenges. And then the infrastructure package actually directs $2.5 billion in funding to transmission projects and an additional $3 billion for smart grid grants, which would use new technologies to help deliver more power over existing lines. And just to give you an industry perspective, um, this information or this grant and funding is a nice signal to the industry But there is still a long way to go, says uh, my good friend uh, uh, Rob Gramlich, who is the president of consulting firm Grid Strategies LLC and an executive director uh, of Americans for a Clean Energy Grid. Uh, This is a group that is advocating for more high-capacity transmission uh, because a uh, $20 billion a year is spent on transmission uh, in the U.S. now, according to Rob, uh, while reaching the Biden administration's decarbonization goal we would need uh, in this decade alone uh, in new investments almost 300 billion so you can imagine the magnitude we spend 20 billion but we need 300 billion in new investments so according to mr gramlich the infrastructure measure um, actually aims to strengthen the federal government's role in transmission line siting while interstate natural gas pipeline routes fall under federal purview transmission lines must go state by state for approvals which has been a hurdle to better uh, linking the country's electric grid. So building uh, more high-capacity transmission has long been understood to be critical uh, if the country wants to accelerate the adoption of renewable energy. Uh, Texas, for example, has a $6.9 billion investment in transmission lines connecting windy West Texas with large cities like Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, and Austin. And Texas has turned itself into a top generator of Uh, renewable electricity. And just to give you another industry quote, the best renewable resources are typically in the middle of the country or in the southwest where not a lot of people live, according to another good friend of mine from a company called Smart Wires, Ted Block Rubin, who is a director of business development for the Americas at this power technology company, Smart Wires. Yeah, you need that. The, the grid to transform it. So it won't be straightforward uh, shift from fossils to renewables. We know that. How do you see the implementation of law? Will there be bumps on the road and what would those be? Sure. I want to take uh, your question about these bumps and obviously this transition or transformation is not straightforward from fossils to renewables. But I want to frame it in, a, in another way, which is which companies or industries do I think will be the biggest beneficiaries of this energy spending package? Because I believe there are many uh, demand response, use load, that's demand response. There, I believe there are many um, demand response aggregators who will benefit once the reality sets in after the dust settles. And here's why. There is a lot of frustration um, with the interconnection of renewable projects uh, today uh, because As we know, transmission is needed to deliver that energy, but it takes 10 years to build. The production tax credits for wind and now nuclear are good, but the action is still all on the supply side, in the generation side. We need attention and we need action on the demand side because supply and demand must balance uh, energy in real time. 
I think this is why uh, Generac, a backup generator company, acquired Enbala, a, a software platform company that coordinates multiple uh, demand side technologies to balance power. And, and an, another example is an aggregator called Voltus, who is operating in all North American energy markets, is going public with a, a billion dollar SPAC. Uh, Voltus, as you know, is a big player in something called operating reserves on a, a next uh, that help the grid operators balance uh, energy in uh, the next five minute to 30 minute increments. Mm. So it sounds like the private sector is responding positively to the signals from the administration. But uh, you you were talking about all these billions and trillions and uh, large sums of money. So the bill, do you see it as spending money or is it going to be earning money? I, I.e., is it spending or is it an investment? So the, the, obviously, if you're talking about billions and trillions, and it makes my head spin just to think about those numbers and how to keep them straight. But it is in general spending, uh, in my opinion, but it is spending in the short term, at least part of it is, um, because the other part is investment in the U.S. infrastructure for the long term. Even that spending, I believe, is paid for uh, with a variety of revenue streams, including more than $200 billion in repurposed funds originally intended for coronavirus relief, but left unused. Uh, I think another $50 billion is going to come from delaying a Trump era rule on Medicare rebates. And then another 50 billion is going to come from states returning unused unemployment insurance supplemental funds. So, and then the US Senate, uh, the US senators actually said they expect about 30 billion um, will be generated from applying information reporting requirements for uh, cryptocurrency, as well as uh, nearly 60 billion uh, will come from economic growth that is spurred by the spending, as well as an 87 billion from past and future sales of wireless spectrum space. Okay, so there's return on investment in the horizon. Um, all right, so we have this bill uh, passed, or two bills actually. Uh, what happens now? How, how long until America is fully renewable, or is that even a goal? I, I believe I believe it is, but there are some who don't believe America is um, fully would be fully renewable, and I don't think this transition would fail because the consumers are driving this bus. Uh, when we look uh, just what is happening, we're transforming the sourcing of our energy from supply that is polluting to supply that is non-polluting, and uh, corporate uh, consumers like uh, Google, Microsoft, Meta. They are driving the need for renewable purchase agreements because they want to lead and show how to power their uh, 24 by 7 data center operations with renewables because their consumers, which who we are, are demanding it. Hence, there are a lot of renewable projects, uh, mostly solar, in these uh, interconnection queues right now uh, at most grid operators. And uh, industrial consumers are looking for ways to generate on-site energy and they want to sell that excess energy back to the grid. So they have always done the selling uh, part, but now they are realizing there is an additional market opportunity uh, for this excess energy. And so that leaves residential consumers. Here we can uh, pick up uh, energy storage thread uh, that I mentioned earlier. Coal can indeed be uh, stored uh, in piles on site, uh, a coal plant, but the coal uh, pile is useless uh, if it is frozen. Uh, due to a winter uh, event or a slush uh, event. So similarly, gas can be stored, but even that is a problem if the pipeline, gas pipeline is down. Uh, and, and if the gas provides capacity, if the gas pipeline is down, what are we going to do? So energy storage in general, uh, I think, is something that can come to the rescue because our current focus is on lithium-ion batteries. Um, these are short duration batteries in two, four hour or six hour uh, blocks. But the next horizon uh, storage is long duration storage, which is two to three days. And and we think, um, so in, so my view at least for uh, people who don't believe renewables and America will be fully renewable is, we will fail if we think we will fail, but if we think we will win, we will at least progress in the right direction. And isn't that something? Yeah, uh, that's so insightful. Thanks so much for these views. 
So also, Ra, you recently co-authored a book called Modern Electricity Systems, Engineering, Operations and Policy. Please give us a short run through. What is that book all about? Sure. And this uh, book uh, that I uh, rewrote with a co-author and two co-authors actually is about uh, infrastructure topic, actually, if if we think about uh, which we have been talking about here recently. Uh, in the book, we discuss examples of how trade-offs on natural gas and renewables are providing reliability in Europe. While some countries in Europe are going through this uh, uh, reduction in fossils and reducing their reliance on fossils, there are others who are increasing nuclear energy and bringing that into the mix. Uh, France comes to mind. Another trade-off in the book that we discuss is based on one of my co-authors' experience with uh, Nepal, where he comes from, and how Nepal, a small country, has pushed the envelope on some of these deregulation uh, aspects because Nepal wants to move away from energy poverty issues. Uh, and another example in the book is how some of these crises that are happening today, uh, like the Texas winter storm in 2021, the energy market crisis in Germany, these are all issues that are happening today that we show how there is a trade-off between energy policies that could drive costs for consumers, but that could also be a sustainable choice. So we think newer technologies are far more flexible, and that's what the point we make in this book. Okay, strong read recommendation for our readers. Thank you very much, uh, Raul, for visiting uh, Deep Pockets podcast again. And for your many interesting points of view, it's been a great pleasure to have you here. Would you have any final words or greetings for our listeners? What would you like the listeners to take with them from today's episode? Uh, thank you, Petra, uh, for this opportunity. Very much appreciated. If, if I can leave something uh, to the listeners, uh, the key takeaway would be that renewables are driving uh, the energy transformation. They are already here. There are a lot of grid that are incorporating renewables. And so I think it's in our best interest to look at available options to incorporate renewables because most countries need renewables to have to move from a polluting uh, supply to a non-polluting supply. And the infrastructure has to be kept up to incorporate these renewables. So that is the main point that I would like your listeners to read. You've listened to Deep Pockets by Petra Söderling. To subscribe to content and to pre-order the book Governments and Innovation, The Economic Developer's Guide to Our Future, please go to petrasoderling.com. The wonderful music you heard is by Leroy Jones, an iconic New Orleans Jazz Hall of Fame trumpetist. You can find this and other Leroy Jones tunes at your favorite online or offline music store. Thanks for listening. And be sure to subscribe, like, rate, and share our episodes. It means a lot to me. Thank you.